So after the uproar in Ephesus has finally died down, Paul uh, gathers everybody together and encourages them. And he sets out for his further journeys in Macedonia and Greece. So it says here in Acts 20 that uh, after saying goodbye to everybody, he left initially for Macedonia. Uh, at every place that Paul passed through, he brought words of great comfort and encouragement to all the believers. And then he went on to Greece and stayed there for around about three months. There, we're talking about the years 56 to 57, so he's probably staying there through the winter. And this is the time when Paul probably wrote down the book of Romans. And just after this, notice it says that just as Paul was allowed to set sail for Syria, he learned of a, pot, uh, a plot against him and he decided to return to Macedonia. But also at this, uh, as, this, as we get into this chapter, we see that it starts to talk about we again. And so Luke has rejoined the group. They celebrate Passover together and then they sail um, off once more. On Sunday, we gathered to take communion and hear Paul preach. Notice how important it is to the early church to break bread together. This is something that they do when they have meetings. It's something when they meet in each other's households. It's an important thing to do. And one of the great things of this time has been really to set people free to be celebrating and breaking bread together in their homes again. Um, so Paul speaks through the night because he says he's planning to uh, leave the next day. Now a lay in for Paul. And it says he continued to speak until past midnight. You see, you thought this Paul could speak for a long time. St. Paul could completely outdo me. And there were many flickering lamps burning in the upstairs chamber where we were meeting. This is just one of those little phrases of Luke, isn't it, that he, that he throws in that makes it so real. You realise he was there. Many flickering lamps burned in the upstairs room or chamber where we were meeting. Sitting in an open window listening was a young man named Eutychus. And as Paul's sermon dragged on, this is the gospel, this is the book of Acts. This is Luke. Writing as the Paul's sermon dragged on. He's talking about St. Paul. Anyway, Eutychus became drowsy and he fell into a deep slumber. And sound asleep, he fell three stories to his death below. That's going to be a bit of a downer on any meeting that's going on. You know, when someone actually falls out of a window because they've fallen asleep because you've been preaching so long. You, 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 that's not a great uh, situation to be in. Paul went downstairs, bent over the boy and embraced him. Taking him in his arms, he said to all the people gathered, stop worrying, he's come back to life. Amazingly, it then says Paul went back upstairs, served communion and ate a meal with them. Then he picked up, picked up where he left off and taught until dawn. I wonder if there were any others falling asleep in that room at that time. Maybe not. Maybe the teaching was amazing. As I said, this was around the time that St. Paul was writing the book of Romans. So it would have been fascinating to hear that teaching preached for the very first time, wouldn't it? Filled with enormous joy, uh, the boy's family, boy's friends, presumably boy's parents, they took the boy home alive and everyone was encouraged. I bet they were. You don't get much of a more of confirmation that I preach Christ died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again than seeing a boy fall out of a window and to be brought back to life again. Anyway, it says that continuing our journey, we made our way to the ship and some of the guys go off on ship and Paul decides to walk uh, around the coastline rather than go straight across uh, and they're all going to meet up again. Paul is actually in quite a hurry because he's got this uh, sense of uh, that he needs to be in Jerusalem. Now this prophetic word's coming and we'll see more in chapter 21 that there something is going to happen that doesn't sound good at all but the prophetic word is go uh, and so Paul is doing that. Um, so when they arrived in Ephesus, Paul calls uh, basically all the elders together. Uh, in fact, Paul isn't in Ephesus himself. He's, he's in a place called Miletus and he's calling the 
elders from the church in Ephesus to come to him. Maybe he doesn't want to riot like what like happened last time. And it says that when they arrived, they said to him, all of you know, or he said to them, all of you know how I've lived and conducted myself while I was with you. From the first day I set foot in Western Turkey, I've operated in God's miracle power. Now, if you're reading in, uh, say, the NIV, it just says, I've served the Lord. And that's what the Greek says. The Aramaic text actually brings in this, I've operated in God's miracle power. Well, he certainly has. He's just had this boy come back from the dead. With great humility and served you with many tears. If you follow Jesus, I don't want to disappoint you, but it's not always going to be a laugh a minute. There are the times that we serve in tears. And this is because it's real life. Particularly if you're going to serve in leadership, there will be the times when it is tears because things haven't gone how you expected, how you wanted. Paul, particularly, as he says here, I've endured numerous ordeals because of the plots of the Jews. You know that how I've taught you in public meetings and in your homes and that I've not held anything back from you that would help you grow. Notice how Paul stresses here. I've taught in the public meetings and in your homes. And if there's one thing that God's given us back in this church reset, it is the freedom to meet in our homes. Now, as I speak at the moment, the current law for us, it might have changed if you're watching this recording months ahead, is six people, but it's still six people. We can still meet in group of six in our homes and teach one another. That's probably less, uh, a smaller size than most of our house church groups, but you know, we can split and meet in groups as needed and take it in turns to teach one another, read the word and see what you can do when you start. That's when you preach the word. That's, that's how it all begins. That's how it all happens. That's what house church is for, to test these things. The church was born, Pentecost, in an absolutely massive meeting and 3,000 people all uh, get saved together. But the church continued to grow in different size meetings. It sounds like the one that Eutychus in was not exactly a small one, but they did meet from house to house, from homes, and that is how the church grows. That is how the church is sustained. That is part of the future of Church Reset. Meeting at the summit? Absolutely but also meeting in even bigger meetings and also the value of our households and our house church meetings. So important as we move forward. And Paul says uh, a little bit about, um, I urged both the Jews and the non-Jews to, uh, to turn from sin to God and to have our faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, that really is the basic gospel message that we therefore learn that Paul is preaching. This message to turn from sin. Now, the word sin as such isn't there in the Greek or the Aramaic. The Greek word that is used there is this word metanoia. And in the Greek, really, it, it means what Paul says is, I have taught, I have urged. There's a real sense of urgency. I've urged, I've earnestly preached repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really important to get, actually. This word metanoia means a change of mind. This is no magic prayer that you just say and ask Jesus into your life. This is repentance. This is a complete change of mind at the way you live your life. So it means, for example, that you don't carry on living the same way. If somebody prays what we sometimes call the sinner's prayer of giving their life to Jesus, but there is no change in their lifestyle, it's highly unlikely that they have really, truly responded to Jesus because the true response to Jesus is a change of mind which leads to a change of practice. You can't just continue living exactly as you were, particularly if you are caught up in some uh, repetitive sin. There has to be a breaking, but it is a change of mind. That's what metanoia is. Uh, earlier, when Paul was in Athens, Acts 17, we, we see that Paul there is saying there must be a repentance. He says that God is summoning all to repentance. God is calling everybody to change their minds, basically to change their minds about who is in charge of their life and allow him to be law. 
have you ever thought that the ability to repent is actually a gift from God? Sometimes people think of it as a bad thing. Repentance is a gift from God. It's only possible because of the sacrifice that Jesus made in the cross. That's what made repentance possible. His death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven is what enables us to repent. Paul, as I said earlier, was writing the book to the Romans around this period of time. And one of the things he writes in the book of Romans in the second chapter is, or do you think lately of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Not knowing the kindness of God is what leads you to repentance. God is not wishing to smash people over the head with repentance. He's not wanting to shout people into repentance. It's actually a kind God that calls people to change their minds and make him the Lord of their lives rather than their own desires. And that repentance is towards God. There's a turning from the old way you've lived your life and a turning towards who God is, what he represents, his person coming back into relationship with him. And this could only happen, as it says, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that trust, that cleaving to, that relying upon, that conviction that Jesus is the Lord of all. And that is what repentance is. That's why it says we walk by faith, not by sight. You see, we can see things happening around us that don't line up with the God at word, God's word because this is a fallen world. There will always be that. But we walk by faith in what we cannot see. OK, that's not as strange as it sounds. Most people, uh, when they're in love with someone, they have faith that they are in love with someone. They really believe it and they believe that person loves them back. You can't really see love. You can see the consequences of love, but you cannot see God. But you can see the consequences of God. And so Paul here reminds them of this very basic gospel message that it is a changing of mind and a turning towards God and a putting our faith in Jesus. And that very process is going to bring change, therefore, in people's lives. You change your mind, you change the way you use your body, you change the way your spirit responds to God. After this, Paul talks to the guys and, and tells them, these leaders from Ephesus, that he's going to Jerusalem. And he says that the Holy Spirit has warned him that chains and afflictions are prepared for you. Not the most encouraging word to come from the Holy Spirit. And he says, but whether I live or die, it's not important. My life is not indispensable. What an attitude of serving the Lord. It's more important for me to fulfill my destiny and to finish the ministry my Lord Jesus has assigned to me and you have a destiny and you have a ministry that the Lord has assigned to you, which is to faithfully preach. Everybody has this part to faithfully preach the wonderful news of God's grace. Obviously, it was a key part of everything that Paul did. But for all of us, our lifestyles share that message of God's grace. What is God's grace? The gift of repentance. And Paul basically says goodbye to these guys and he encourages the leaders because his expectation, he doesn't have a word from God for this, but his expectation at this time is that he's not going to see these people again. It must have been quite a tearful and emotional goodbye. You get that impression just by reading that here. And he warns the people, I know that after I leave, after I leave, imposters who have no loyalty to the flock will come amongst you like savage wolves. People who want to just be leaders, who, people who want status, people who want people to recognize them. The most dangerous leaders that exist. They're not really God's leaders. And he even warns them that some from your very own ranks, people amongst you from uh, uh, who, are, who are right now, part of the group, part of the team. They will rise up and twist the truth to seduce people into following them instead of following Jesus. You do get these people that want to gather followers and lead, uh, people to themselves. I don't want you to be gathered to me. We want people to be gathered to Jesus. So Paul says, so stay alert. Sounds like the warning of the government right now. But this stay alert is to look for the, and be discerning the gift of discernment of the Holy Spirit. 
And remember that for three years, night and day, I've never stopped warning each of you, pouring my heart to you with tears. Stay alert. Don't just follow the latest person that has a good teaching, even when they come from within where you are. It must be checked with the word of God, but also checked with those whom God has put you with. That is so important. So many people miss that. Why has God placed you in the church that you're in so that you will learn from those leaders? That's why it's so important to be in a healthy, good church, because those are your first source of leaders. Your first source of truth is scriptures, of course. Anyway, we need to uh, leave these people here. As Paul finishes speaking, it says he knelt down and prayed with them. And they all cried with great weeping as one after another hugged Paul and kissed him. Like I was saying, it was an emotional departure. What broke their hearts were his, were his words, you will not see my face again. And then they tearfully accompanied Paul back to the ship that he could continue on his mission. Hallelujah. Well, thank you for listening. Be blessed and keep in touch. Stay safe. If you're liking these videos,